Good afternoon. I'm John Epstein from EcoHealth Alliance. Welcome to the NEPA Virus 360 panel, part of the EcoHealth 2019 Research Coordination Network Biennial Student Workshop. We're here at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, one of our hosts for the 2019 workshop, along with Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Smithsonian Institution. EcoHealth Net is a program led by EcoHealth Alliance in partnership with 15 research institutions in the US and abroad. We're funded by the National Science Foundation, and it's designed to bring students together, graduate and undergraduate STEM students, with professional scientists to discuss issues around the complex matter of infectious disease, particularly zoonotic disease, that require multiple disciplines and approaches to understand some of the very important global challenges we face, preventing epidemics of zoonosis. The purpose of today's presentation is to provide a snapshot of that complexity and how to respond to outbreaks, both through research channels and through surveillance and communication efforts. We specifically have brought together a panel of experts representing some of the different disciplinary approaches to addressing these complex issues. These are experts who have worked on various aspects of NEPA virus, from outbreak response and surveillance to animal models and pathogenesis, to understanding molecular function of NEPA virus and crisis communication and global communications in terms of communicating the uh, outbreaks and coordinating efforts to control them. In fact, this is a timely discussion because as we speak just today, there's been a confirmed new case of Nipah virus in Kerala state in southern India, one year after the initial outbreak in that region. So our conversation today will be timely in terms of understanding this virus, its disease, and what we know about its ecology and efforts to control it. Before I specifically introduce our panel, I want to mention that in addition to our graduate students who are, and undergraduate students who are here in the room, we're broadcasting live over the internet. So welcome to all of you who are joining us virtually. We're going to speak with our panel and then open up the conversation to Q&A, both within the room and to our participants through Zoom link. If you want to ask our panelists a question, use the chat function in Zoom and we'll acknowledge you and then turn on the microphone. Please be sure to have your camera on as well because we'll be able to see you in the room. We can have a conversation. <clears throat> you can also just type in questions into the chat uh, window and if you don't want to ask them directly, we'll try our best to address them in conversation. So let's begin our discussion. Let me introduce our panelists. Immediately to my right is Dr. Emily Gurley. She's a professor of epidemiology and global health at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she spent 12 years in Bangladesh working at ICDDRB, leading up the Outbreak Disease Response and Surveillance Group. And she has worked over this time looking at the ecology of Nipah virus, its epidemiology, understanding how outbreaks occur, and working with the government of Bangladesh to help control and contain them. She currently serves as WHO's part of WHO's Nipah virus task force and is on, has ongoing research looking at developing medical countermeasures for Nipah virus. Dr. Vincent Munster is a virologist and director of the Virus Ecology Unit at NIH's Rocky Mountain Laboratories in Hamilton, Montana. He focuses on cross-species transmission and spillover of emerging pathogens like Nipah virus and Ebola, and has done a lot of work developing animal models to help us understand pathogenesis or the progression of viral replication inside its host so that we can better understand how Nipah virus disease occurs and to help develop countermeasures and therapeutics to prevent disease from happening. Professor Christopher Broder is the Chief of uh, Microbiology and Immunology at Uniform Services University in Bethesda, Maryland, and he's focused on the molecular receptors that allow Nipah virus and other viruses to gain entry into cells and replicate. Dr. Broder is currently working with the CEPI Coalition to, to help develop vaccine against Nipah virus. He'll be talking to us today about the efforts to develop therapeutics and vaccines. And Dr. Larry Madoff is the medical director for the State Epidemiology Lab in Massachusetts Public Health Department and a professor at UMass Medical Center and Harvard University. He's also an editor at ProMed, which is a global listserv that collates information about emerging disease events around the world in humans, animals, and plants. And it's an important early warning and sentinel system for, um, in, as an adjunct to traditional surveillance methods. 
So welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us today. And I wanted to start by setting the table. And Emily, I'll start with you. But tell us, what is Nipah virus? And, and why is it something we should be paying attention to? Mm. Um, well, Nipah is a disease that's transmitted from bats to people. Um, as you know well, uh, Nipah likely co-evolved with Tropus bats, and so wherever we find those bats, uh, we're likely to find Nipah virus. And then there are specific pathways um, where people become infected with Nipah from bats. I think we're still learning about what all of those pathways are across the host range of these bats, but in Bangladesh, uh, we've seen year after year that people are infected through uh, drinking raw date palm sap, uh, which is a national delicacy. So for me, what is Nipah? Nipah is a disease uh, that frequently causes devastating outbreaks in places like Bangladesh and is of global concern because of its ability to be transmitted from person to person. And what does Nipah look like as a disease? What is a, a person who's infected with Nipah virus? How do they present? Um, disease starts with fever, and almost all NEPA patients that we know about will progress to have some kind of neurological disease or very serious respiratory disease, sometimes both. And it's highly fatal. So in outbreak to outbreak, case fatality uh, ratios can range from 50% to 90 or more. And you know, we're now, both fortunately and unfortunately, we've had the benefit of repeated experiences with Nipah outbreaks in Bangladesh, but you've worked there for many years, including in some of the early days when the Nipah was just beginning to emerge there. What were some of the early challenges in recognizing this disease in Bangladesh and, and starting to prepare to respond to it? Well, if you want to recognize a disease or identify an outbreak, the first thing you need is a good diagnostic, a good way to measure whether or not someone has infection. Um, I think that we're still limited today in our ability to rapidly diagnose patients uh, that um, can cause delays in responding and investigating. Um, but early on, it was even worse. <laughs> yeah. So it's still a problem, but early on, it was even worse. Um, Back then, at, say 15 years ago, there was no in-country laboratory, for example, in Bangladesh. And so all of our patient specimens had to be shipped to the labs at the US CDC to confirm whether or not people had NEPA. Uh, so it took a couple of weeks. So um, we have labs now in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, uh, at the ICDDRB, and at, um, at the Bangladesh government um, organization that that lead surveillance activities. So now it's a matter of days um, where we can diagnose patients instead of weeks, but still a bit longer than we'd like. And, and what is the ICD here? Can you describe the sort of genesis of the partnership that, that institution has had with the government? Sure. So the ICDDRB, uh, also known as the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh, uh, they moved beyond diarrhea decades ago, so they typically go by the ICD-DRB now. Uh, but they have been in Bangladesh since before Bangladesh was Bangladesh. Uh, so they started um, in the 1960s as a cholera research lab. There's still a cholera research uh, hospital there. Um, but they've been involved in surveillance and really supporting the government of Bangladesh and public health activities since their inception, and that's always been their goal. Um, they pride themselves on being a part as much as possible of the Bangladesh healthcare system. Um, and, and the government also uh, accepts, accepts them as part of, of the whole public health endeavor. So early on when outbreaks were first being recognized in Bangladesh, uh, the government reached out to ICDDRB for technical support. Um, and the relationship around NEPA flourished from there. And I, I think it, it did so because um, each institution has a separate mandate, one for research, one for public health response. But in those situations where resources are scarce and you're learning something new, uh, both can really uh, help each other. Uh, and there are a lot of synergies in, in having that partnership, which I think everyone recognized. And so those early days of, of NEPA 
outbreaks of Bangladesh really around 2001, 2002, 2003. <clears throat> when, did, when did you start to realize through investigation that this was a virus that wasn't just appearing in one or two people and then dead ending, but how did you know that this was starting to spread among people and, and what was the thought process there in terms of its potential risk? Um, so one of the first outbreak, Neva outbreak investigations that I participated in was in 2004, and we had a report from a local uh, health official that he believed that they had some a few Neva cases, and there was a request for our team to come out uh, and take a look. So um, when we got to the village. Uh, where cases were occurring, it became clear that there were many people who were very seriously ill. And then once we collected um, information about those, uh, when those people became ill, what were some exposures that they had had, it became clear that they had all had contact with one person who had died with similar symptoms recently, which suggested, suggested to us uh, very strongly that whatever this disease was, it was being transmitted from person to person. And at the time, there hadn't been any public recognition that NEPA could be transmitted between people. Um, so again, it was, it was that time when it still took a few weeks to diagnose cases because we had to send specimens out. Um, but it was, a, it was a troubling time because, um, because you know, we weren't expecting NEPA to be able to do this. Um, to be transmitted between people. And so uh, it did turn out to be NEPA. Uh, it also turns out that the, one of the first outbreaks in India in 2001 had also been transmitted person to person. If we look back at the first outbreaks in Bangladesh in 2001, 2003, if you look at the epidemiologic curves of, of how those outbreaks unfolded, it's clear that they were also transmitted from person to person. The problem is no one was looking for that. Because, um, of course, the original Malaysia outbreak, it wasn't really a feature, at least not, not a known feature. It wasn't a salient feature yeah. that was recognized. But if you go back to those papers, they didn't investigate it uh, very carefully in their epidemiologic studies. So um, there were some suggestions that two nurses may have become <clears throat> infected, um, but it wasn't investigated rigorously. So, I, so um, all we had was you know, what had been reported before. But we've seen person-to-person -person transmission consistently. Uh, since then, since we knew it, it, it's out there, we've seen it consistently, including in the outbreaks that are have, that happened in Kerala um, and a Nipah-like virus outbreak that happened in the Philippines, the Philippines as well. So, so this is, you know, and what is the, the case fatality rate, or when you get some people, you know, how serious is it? It it, it varies. Um, People who are infected from another patient tend to survive more often than people infected through direct contact with bats or bat secretions, in our experience in Bangladesh. But still, among those case patients, the case fatality is about 50%. And, and Larry, just to, to come over and I'm thinking about ProMed now, can you remember the days when reports were coming out about some of these early outbreaks? In Bangladesh, because for a while it was really just the, the the Malaysia experience, a single outbreak, and then suddenly you're starting to see repeated instances. Right. It was, um, and, and I think one of the features of of the outbreak was the lack of recognition of of Nipah as a new entity. Actually, um, you know, when, when when your tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And um, when, when cases of, of NEPA began in the late 90s, they were initially thought to be a Japanese encephalitis virus, but some of the parts of the picture didn't fit. And astute observers, astute virologists figured out that this really wasn't JE and, and eventually uh, came to recognize it as a new entity, a novel agent. And of course, we, we now understand pretty well that there was a very different spillover pattern, a route of transmission from bat reservoirs to people than occurred in Malaysia, whereas in Malaysia it was primarily through infected pigs, almost exclusively. But uh, Emily, talk about how the early investigation started to recognize Dave sap as an important feature, and what was the approach to ruling out livestock, looking at livestock, making sure that there weren't other animal involvement as well? Um, but 
to take Larry's point, I mean, new viruses should surprise us, right? We should be looking for new things about them because we just met them. We don't know them very well. And so I, in the first outbreaks in Bangladesh, they were focused on pigs and other livestock, other animal reservoirs, uh, because that's what was known. I think in 2004, we took a bit of a broader approach um, where we thought about every possible way someone could have come into contact with a sick animal or a bat or anything that had a bat secretion on it. And that involved walking through villages, in-depth conversations with people about what they did in their daily lives. And we made the longest list we could come up with about different ways people could be exposed. And that laundry list questionnaire exists still today. So um, we ask the same questions of every, um, every NEPA patient every year, as well as controls to try to understand risk factors. Because yeah, you find what you're looking for, right? <laughs> so you have to be looking for everything so you never miss it. Yeah, and I, and I think it also speaks to, you know, we're now seeing, we saw two different phenomena. We saw pigs get infected and infect people, and then we saw people getting infected without perhaps evidence uh, exposure to other sick animals and eventually direct um, exposure to bats via um, a foodborne route. But, but Vincent, let's, let's talk about how the laboratory work, how experimental work can also help define how a virus is able to move through different animals and people. Because there's the epidemiologic investigations and it depends on getting histories from people and observation to understand routes of transmission. But it's not always exhaustive and it doesn't always get at mechanisms. So what can we learn from working with viruses like NEPA in the lab? Yeah, I think, I think it's really good to point out on one hand, of course, all the, the great epidemiological field work that's been going on in Bangladesh, and of course starting with Hendra virus, uh, the original parameter virus, and NEPA virus outbreak. Um, but you can only do so much on a more observational scale. So with having these laboratory approaches, you can take those viruses into the lab actually look a little bit more mechanistically, for instance, in how these viruses get transmitted, what are the first target cells they actually infect, if they have the initial infect, and how do they move through the body, and how do they actually cause disease. So that's something we've been working on, and of course there's a, there's a whole number of other labs that we've been working on that. But then, of course, you have to realize in the back of, back of your mind that this is what we call a high containment virus. So right. there's a degree of viruses which needs the highest containment, like Ebola virus and Marburg virus, which severely limited the amount of laboratories who can actually work with live virus. Yeah, and, and describe the lab a little bit. Describe the Rocky Mountain Laboratories and, and what is a BSL-4 lab? What does that mean and what does it look like when you're working with NEPA virus in the lab? So BSL-4 stands for Biosafety Level 4, so we have a category based from one to four, one is a very limited setting and then you move up to two. Three would be something you work with, like something like avian influenza or MERS coronavirus, and then four is for the, the most highest risk viruses. And basically you can look at the lab as some kind of like a submarine. So you have kind of negative pressure completely enclosed where people go in via uh, uh, via a very specific shower, uh, everything is negatively pressurized. So in the moment you would have a leak, everything gets sucked in. So the air changes take place, what we call highly efficient particulate filters, so HEPA filters, tendemized. So there's no risk for anything coming out. And the scientists who work there actually move into their in pressure suits. So they basically move into their own private little bubble on air hoses from air hose to air hose. And that basically allows us to work very safely. Um, that said, obviously, in the countries where uh, this particular virus is endemic, whether that would be Bangladesh or Malaysia, uh, you could actually do a certain amount of manipulations on by biosafety level three or even the biosafety level two. And, and why is NEPA virus in particular among the high containment pathogens? Why is it classified? Yeah, and that, that basically ties it and directly back to what Emily already said. High case fatality rate, so high personal risk, human to human transmission mobility, and of course, <coughs> no protein measures. So there's no treatment, no vaccine yet, um, which has been approved. And of course, Chris can talk a little bit more about where we're currently at in the development of countries. 
And so a lot of the work you've done is to understand how Nipah virus operates in living organisms and using animal models to really understand human disease as well. Um, but let me ask you a two-part question. One is, why is it important to identify? We've talked a lot uh, so far about the, the human epidemiology and what Nipah looks like when it gets into the human population. But why is it important to understand where it comes from in nature? In other words, identify an animal reservoir. And how can the work in the lab complement field work to help define what that animal reservoir may be? So on one hand is, of course, like stepping back. And where, where I come from is the field of AUV which is by far the typical zoonosis we know the most of. We know basically every piece of waterfowl have their own specific avian influenza viruses. We know how it moves into poultry production and then can develop in these highly pathogenic avian influenza strains. So the problem is what happens when you actually have something where you actually have limited information. So I come from Europe and the same as here in North America. We have a lot of people who love birds, ornithologists. So not only do we know by, by pretty good, good estimation the population sizes, we know exactly how they move. We know where they winter. We know how they breed. So now you take this information, what you want to know, and something new pops up. You kind of establish a link with bats, and then you kind of figure out, well, actually, we don't really know that much about these bats. We don't really know how many of these bats are there. We actually don't know if they have seasonal migration. We actually don't know how many viruses they actually can harbor. We don't really know how people get in contact with these bats. Uh, and I, I think that kind of sums up uh, one degree of questions is, of course, like, then if you move that into the lab, like how do these viruses cause disease? And only if you know how it really causes disease, you can actually start thinking about like, how to develop like, effective countermeasures. Yeah, and, and Chris, that, that brings me to ask you, we, we start to get a sense of the, the impact Nipah virus has on human populations. We, we understand where it might be coming from or where it does come from, in bats. How do we take that information and start to understand how Nipah virus affects people and other animals and, and move towards possible vaccine or therapeutics? Because is that the, that's not only a way to protect human health, but it's really to start to get a, a handle and control um, some of these epidemics and perhaps take Nipah virus out of that high containment category and make it a little less dangerous. So, so how do we start to get an understanding of how it infects people and animals? Well, actually, one of the students asked me that. I'll, I'll just your last point. I don't believe that even if we had a vaccine or effective uh, <laughs> countermeasure that Nipah would be classified less than level four. <laughs> I don't okay. think that's going to happen. May not be um, yeah. But... Uh, I think what's it, so as Vincent mentioned, bringing the viruses in and, and studying virus cellular interactions is really how I my lab started in this um, nearly just about 20 years ago. And early on, they knew that in animals that were susceptible to severe disease, for example, they would all be classified as a systemic vasculitis. Well, by studying the virus over those in the early 2000s, we and Ben Release Group, in addition, were able to discover what receptors on cells these viruses actually infected. And it basically explained vascular, widespread vascular disease, because the receptors ended up being effort receptors. And effort B2 in particular is highly expressed on endothelial cells throughout the body, not only in people, but in animals as well. And so just for the audience, what endothelial cells are found where in the body? So endothelial cells basically make up your blood vessels. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the receptor you identified, is that something particular to people? No. So the efferin B2 receptor is amongst all vertebrates, and it is highly, highly conserved. So thinking about the circumstances in which you understand how viruses can jump from bats, in this example, to other species, the receptor use that these viruses chose, that NEPA chose, for whatever reason, they, these viruses were primed to jump into a number of different animals. And in the Malaysia outbreak, which you had just discussed a short time ago, um, not only were the pigs the amplifying reservoir on those pig farms, but there were ponies that were infected, and there were dogs that were infected, and cats, as well as people. So early on, they knew, very similar, actually, in that outcome, cats also were susceptible hosts to enderovirus. So it, it brings up an important point. The, the real, you know, 
importance of understanding some of these cellular level mechanisms like receptor binding and entry is you can start to make predictions about a virus as to how broad a host range it may have. Absolutely. What animals may yeah. be infected, how easily it might jump. Now you can find a virus that is highly specialized, right? That uses a particular receptor only found, say, in one type of animal, and that virus would probably be more likely to stay within that species. But you have something like Nipah and Hendra virus, which is related, that uses a, a receptor found in so all vertebrates, right? right. All mammals. So, so that's a concern. Uh, that's one piece to yeah. the puzzle. I think what Vincent just mentioned, which we sort of brushed over actually all day, is the fact that bat efferent receptors are identical as well. So as you mentioned, why is it that bats can host these viruses and yet cause no disease? Now my lab in particular doesn't work in that area. Basically, it's trying to understand why bats don't get sick. But a lot of groups are looking at that. And that's really another, that's, that's the key, I think, that a lot of people would like to, to make inroads in. Yeah, that's a really important point. We talk about identifying a natural reservoir to understand where viruses come from. And one of the um, qualities we often see in, in wildlife reservoirs is that a pathogen that they carry often doesn't cause severe disease. And that may be through co-evolutionary processes, as you mentioned. And so we know from experimental work that was done in Australia that bats don't get sick from infection with Hendra and Nipah virus, and we've seen it in the field. We've, we've sampled bats that look perfectly healthy to later to find out that they're actually shedding virus. You know, and that's a really important point. But you can't tell a sick bat that's at risk of transmitting Nipah virus by looking at it, because it looks totally normal. In terms of the transmission, though, I think both Nipah and Hendra, it's very clear based on how the virus is shed in saliva and urine. And actually, when that first discovery was made that it was shed in urine at the time, only mumps virus was the only other paramyx virus that was actually known to shed in urine. So the connection on how horses became infected in Australia from a hendra kind of made sense. They're eating grasses or food sources that bats have urinated on or spat out. Yeah. yeah. And, and let's take a step back because we're mentioning hendra virus. Can you just explain the relationship between hendra and the virus in that group? Well, I mean, in the beginning, hendra virus was the first thing we had worked on and really the discovery, the rapid, I think, identification of Nipah as a, as a novel related virus was because of the work just a few years earlier that was done at the CDC in collaboration with the Australians um, to identify and characterize Hendra virus. Because at, at the end of the day, it was the serology that was cross-reacted to the Nipah isolates that were sent to Atlanta. And that serology was based on the Hendra virus prior to that. So then sequencing in short order determined that Nipah's closest relative was Hendra. At the time, probably Hendra was called Hendra-like virus or Equine mobility virus, yeah. but now these are the prototype species now. Yeah. And, and what was the first indication to you that a vaccine was gonna be possible to develop an effective? Virus? Really early on, really early on, because what we wanted to do was find the receptor and understand how the virus is used to infect cells. And that was really what my lab was, was focused on, with a couple of other different viruses too. And so we engineered, um, the protein spike that the virus has on the outside of it, okay? And when we did that, we needed other reagents. So what do you do? You take that protein and you immunize animals, small lab animals, to make antibodies so that you have a reagent that you could use. Well, that antibody reagent, a polyclonal antibody response, you put that back in a virus infection culture and it completely blocked infection. So there you go. So there's your idea of a potential subunit vaccine approach to it. And that's what we've stuck to. For the last 20 years or so. So then, and, and this is a question kind of for all of you, but so we've established that the virus is dangerous, that it spills over periodically in the human populations and shows onward transmission. But in the grand scheme of things, it's still a fairly uh, infrequent event, or let's say that the clusters tend to be small. Why the push to make a vaccine for Nipah virus when there's so many other infectious disease challenges we have in front of us? Why is this a particularly Important issue right now. And Chris may go Well, I mean, as Emily alluded to yeah. in the beginning, NEPA has, NEPA has a basket of characteristics, NEPA Bangladesh in particular, that could potentially spread globally and cause a significant number of human infections, right? Had we not had any ability to, even in a week's time or a day's time, to do the diagnosis, we would be back in the situation of SARS in 2000. Well, and don't, don't forget, like if we're sitting right in now 2019, if we would have this discussion in 2013, we 
we could have had exactly the same discussion on Ebola virus. But then of course, the outbreak in West Africa showed that these viruses where everybody said, well, these are problematic on a small scale, high mortality, they will never become a global problem. And then West Africa now West Africa. Africa. Yeah, And I think point. that's really kind of like a watershed moment for a lot of initiatives where everybody's working on now that, and basically we have now two paradigm shifts. One is Chris's work, completely nice one health approach where they actually have been able to make a vaccine and vaccinate horses in Australia, which is, I think that's a kind of like, like a paradigm change for, for something which actually affects both horses and people. And then secondly, of course, the West African outbreak where we know we have recombinant VSV vaccine, not only being tested, but now actually being used on such a large scale, more than 130,000 people have been vaccinated. And it does suggest, if you look at the EFI data, that it's at least able to suppress to a certain degree the outbreak with all the problems they have to really do the complex traits and they fall out. I think these are two very big paradigm changes in the field of emerging infectious diseases. I, the only thing we know is that we're going to have more pandemics and large outbreaks, but we're still very bad at guessing which ones they're going to be. Um, but it makes good sense, I think, to start with the ones that have already shown us some capacity, and Nipa is on that list, along with Ebola and others. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, the World Health Organization just listed NEPA yeah. among its top 10 infectious disease threats globally. So there's yeah, and then of course, like there's also like, what is it, like Agent X also on the WHO list. Like everything we do right now enables to get a response if something new happens, whether that would be another MERS coronavirus, which uh, emerged quite recently. Uh, definitely all the platform development for vaccines, whether that would be uh, subunit vaccines, live attenuated vaccines, or some of those novel mRNA vaccine approaches. I think that really helps us from really scale up from detection, sequencing to very rapidly being able to intervene. Um, and typically, these, these outbreaks have what they call like a stuttering chains of transmission. So initially, you might still have quite some time to interact until they become very efficient. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, isn't that the big concern that, you know, at one point, the virus might fall or yeah. appear in a way that is more efficiently transmissible for right. people? Right. It, individual outbreaks now are devastating for families and for individual communities. There's no doubt about that. But the global concern is exactly that, that if it were more transmissible, then it would be a risk or problem. And one intervention, but yeah. that, that, uh, that that scenario was the um, was was the plot of contagion. The movie right. Contagion was a very thinly uh, disguised uh, NEPA virus that had become more transmissible and caused a global, uh, very highly lethal pandemic. And I think one of the things we're learning as we start to look in wildlife populations at diseases at pathogens like NEPA virus is that it isn't really just one virus, but rather it's a complex or a spectrum of, of genotypes, of a genetic variation within a group of viruses. And, and we're just starting to recognize the importance of working to understand how the genotype of the virus influences the clinical outcome, right, in patients. And we've seen some differences with different experiences. And what, what, if we, what was different about the outbreak in Malaysia initially than the kind of presentation we're seeing in Malaysia, uh, sorry, in Bangladesh? So it's a, it's a complex problem to try to tease apart um, clinical presentation of a patient um, in our experience is related to whether or not they transmit to someone else, for example, right? If we're interested in person-to-person -person transmission, um, then we're interested in clinical presentation because of its relationship to that. So in Bangladesh, we've seen uh, for example, that patients who present with difficulty breathing are more likely to transmit to someone else than others. So then the question becomes, I think just what you're trying to, you know, what you're asking is, is that driven by strain? Um, is it driven by dose of exposure would be another hypothesis. Is it driven by route of exposure? Um, and, and we don't know. And those things are, 
difficult to tease apart because any given strain is going to spill over in one specific place at one specific time. Um, and rarely do you have multiple types of exposures to that same exact strain. And so I think um, from human observations and investigations, we can come up with some hypotheses. You know, we can try to study outbreaks, um, you know, as intensely as we can um, to generate these hypotheses. But I think going back to what Vincent said earlier, there's a really a limit to what we can understand um, within humans, and that's why, you know, work on animal models is so important, because you can control some of these other variables to try to really hone in on, um, is it strain, is it dose, is it route, is it some, you know, maybe all three play a role, and how do they play a role? I think there's been a lot made about, you know, Nipah Bangladesh is more highly transmissible than these other, you know, strains. I, I would push back on that a bit just to say that um, that's the, in Bangladesh is where we've looked hardest for person-to-person -person transmission. And I think that it hasn't been as systematically studied in other contexts, even where we study it really well, only 10% of patients transmit to someone else. So it's not the most common scenario. So at a play, if you're not looking for it, such as in the Malaysia outbreak, um, or even human cases of Hendra, there have only been a few, um, you know, because we haven't seen it doesn't by definition mean that it's not possible. Yeah. And Vincent, what do, the, what do the animal models tell us about some of the differences we see in genetic strains? Maybe what have we learned so far at least? Yeah, first of all, I think like, like if you, if you talk about Nipah viruses, they're very similar. I think on the nucleotide level, somewhere 95% similarity. Um, and obviously, you have two different outbreak scenarios, introduction, introduction, big production, and then people getting exposed to maybe relatively high doses from pigs, explaining the size and magnitude of that particular outbreak but relatively limited as far as we go into human transmission via a completely different route of exposure by drinking date palm juice. So you're already trying to compare something um, on top of it, like only one outbreak versus like very good recorded data of multiple spillover events. Um, but then getting back, like if you take those two viruses, again, something which kind of hampers us that we typically only use two prototypic strains where we're very fortunate to have more access to strains, basically based on your work and, uh, and Emily's work as well from Bangladesh. Really trying to tease out whether there is a spectrum of like uh, infectivity and pathogenicity among these strains, or whether they're all the same. So interestingly, the, the initial step seems to be very conserved. Uh, Chris already talked about the efferents, so we don't really think that the differences between those viruses is typically at their septal level, because even cedar uses this very abundant, uh, very highly conserved receptor. Cedar so virus being another, another virus in the group uh, of yeah, yeah. viruses, yeah. Um, so basically it needs to go a little bit down, so, and then trying to explain, the, trying to compare related but different parts. And I think here cedar actually plays a very important role because here we have something which has been isolated from a bat, never been associated with any human infection, but in any of the animal models we tested is, is non-pathogenic, less pathogenic. Um, we really delve down to the deeper kind of question. So what then drives successful spillover and uh, being able to develop kind of like a disease spectrum which seems to be more at the level of your innate immunity, so your ability of your body to interact with any incoming virus. Uh, but then going back to the initial question, there seems to be a relatively, uh, I would say, like, like limited differences between those viruses. So if you do, if you look in vitro on endothelial cells, so one of the target cells, as Chris already mentioned, vasculitis, there seems to be a little lag in replication in Bangladesh versus Malaysia. So Malaysia seems to be a little bit quicker. Uh, and we see a little bit that resembling in some of the animal studies we do too, but it is very subtle. So it doesn't, it's not really like when you compare from, 
producing something like a low pathogenic avian influenza virus versus a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus where you inoculate your chickens and nobody gets sick and everybody dies. And that's something we're typically way easier and way better to handle at a laboratory level because the, the moment the differences are more subtle, it increases the amount of manipulations you have to do in your lab to make something really statistically significant. So, Chris, from a vaccine standpoint, is there concern or, or um, how likely is it that a vaccine would protect against a, a range of different strains or genotypes based on what we know? In other words, you're vaccinated against Nipah virus, are you protected against a large array of strains of Nipah, or do you think it's pretty specific to immunity? <clears throat> so the, pro the, the principal antigen that most people now are working with is based on the very early animal data for NEPA and Hendra. And that's that one protein that the virus has known as the G protein. Um, we compared them early on when we started to develop the vaccine. We compared Hendra and NEPA. There were only two strains then, right? So they're actually pretty divergent. So on the amino acid level, they're 80%. That's pretty far apart. But nevertheless, those early experiments revealed to us that we could have a single subunit vaccine that would protect against Hendra and Nipah. Now, when we go to Nipah Malaysia versus Bangladesh, if it's based on the G protein, either one of those is going to equally cross protect. And primary immune response that I think is, is consensus, the preponderance of data shows that a good humoral response is really all that you need. And now we look, that, we look at that in the face of at least four different animal models. So for a vaccine approach, it's, it's a little bit more straightforward as opposed to a pathogenesis approach, which is what Vincent was talking about, where even subtle differences, you, you have a problem comparing one animal model to the next. Yeah. But for a vaccine approach, it's a little bit more straightforward in my view. Yeah. So that's somewhat reassuring. So for example, people yeah. ask that all the time. It's a hendra based G vaccine. Right. Are, are we sure it's going to work against Nipah or a new Nipah strain that's different from Nipah Bangladesh? Well, we're already talking about an antigen that's 80% or 20% divergent, yet it completely cross protects. So I think that there's not going to be an issue of vaccine escape. Now, what is the percent homology? We don't know. If we want to look at Cedar virus, we know that there you're only about 26% identical, even though they use the same receptor. Which is, which, is, which is unique, but that difference is enough that you do not see significant, if any, cross reactivity, right? So we don't know where the bar is. We got something that we're looking at a virus that's 25% versus 80. So what's in between, we don't know. But you know, with the work that we're doing with you right now, we suspect that there's probably a, a host of Hanifa related viruses that are out there. We just haven't found them yet. Which brings me to my next point. So, we look where the spotlight is shining, right? We have great surveillance going in Bangladesh where there have been repeated spillover events and, and have a handle on that. We're starting to pick up on outbreaks in southern India when those are happening. But we know that the group of bats that carry these viruses has a really big geographic <coughs> range you know, throughout Asia into Australia and the Pacific Islands, going west to Madagascar and related bats on continental Africa as well. Now, and Larry, this is for you talking about non-traditional surveillance methods. Vaccines are great if you know where to deploy them, but if outbreaks are happening that are going totally unnoticed, we're potentially in trouble, right? How, can you talk about ProMed a little bit and what the process is like of, of getting wind of a potential event happening and how that filters through ProMed and through the editors there? The principle um, behind uh, non-traditional surveillance is to, um, is, to, is to look for anomalies, if you will, things that uh, don't quite fit the picture um, of, of what you're expecting. You know, as NEPA was initially thought to be JE, so when uh, Zika was introduced to the Americas, it was thought to be something else, chikungunya or dengue, some, some variant, but, but the pieces didn't quite fit. So it takes an astute observer, an astute clinician or laboratorian or layperson to notice that something, some piece of this puzzle doesn't fit and to sound an alarm to let people know, uh, you know, either through the media or through public health, that something is, is going on. Event-based surveillance systems are, are designed that way to pick up um, signals that don't necessarily depend on a lab result 
or um, a, a piece of information that, that from the healthcare system that could be outside of the traditional channels. Another example of that is when Ebola hit in West Africa. Um, one of the reasons it was, it was reported so late was because it wasn't it wasn't supposed to be there. This was not an area where Ebola had been seen, and so when it occurred there, people weren't looking for it or expecting it. It's a, it's an anomaly. It's not um, you know I, I I've discovered something that's something something is odd here. Something doesn't fit, and so the astute observer really is the, is the key in reading to that they surround. But, but sometimes, and particularly in the days now of social media, there's a lot of noise out there. Mm -hmm. And how does ProMed in particular filter out what to report on, what not to report on, what seems that it could just be false or wrong, and, and how do you assess that? Right. Um, so the, the, there is a, a, a glut of information. Yeah. Um, we, we all know that. We all experience that on our inboxes and on other places. Um, and uh, you know, we, we talk about the fire hose of information and how do you intelligently make sense of that, of that huge stream of information? How do you sip from the fire hose? Um, and there are different approaches to that. Some people actually use things like the volume of the fire hose, use um, the, the, the types of things that people are talking about in social media to try to detect anomalies, something that's different from, from usual. Um, Others um, try to, to intelligently mine the information, things like GPIN and HealthApp, that try to use you know, word search, pattern recognition, to try to make sense of the information stream. Um, in the case of ProMed, it's a very human-driven enterprise. We use a, a panel of, of experts to try to, to, to sift through the vast amount of information, and try to find the things that are important and meaningful. But it's a difficult job and it's imperfect. The last year, May 2018, we saw, speaking of talking about Ebola being in a new location, we saw NEPA emerge in a new location, which was southern India. Um, was this surprising to you, Emily, that, that an outbreak happened in Kerala? And now a year later, we're seeing another case there as well. Uh, um, not really, because. Um, you know, the bats that carry the virus live there. So uh, we should expect that um, wherever these bats live, they're interacting with humans in one way or another, probably increasingly so um, as a consequence of deforestation and other human activities. So I don't, I don't think it should have been a surprise. It was, it was far away from the last detected outbreak, but very close to, to reservoir species. There's, there's just always this tendency or temptation to think that things happen linearly, that you know, one outbreak has to be connected to the previous one, either spatially or, or temporally. But really, when you start to look at wildlife reservoirs and the range that exists, what you really need is an interface or a way for that virus to get out into the people. I, I, just to say, I, I think we should be surprised if many patients there previously who had had a similar clinical syndrome had been tested and had been negative and they had never found it mm -hmm. and then it shows up that to me would be a sign that it's new and could be surprising but if you've never tested anyone before or only very few then i don't think there's much of a yeah a basis for surprise right and this in fact just prompts now more rigorous surveillance activities to try to understand do we, know, should, do we yeah. know how spillover happened in southern India? Do we have any information? Um, so um, the outbreak in 2018 has been really well characterized. It a very, uh, a really nice job um, investigating and reporting out quickly um, what happened and everything they know about that outbreak. Um, it was spread primarily through person-to-person -person transmission. And so that's really what they have the power to say something about. The initial index case, they, they don't know how he was infected. And this um, was person-to-person -person transmission in the hospital setting, right? Uh, like, hospital and, and also family members. Yeah. So um, some of that could have been in hospital or in community. But that was the salient feature of that outbreak. So that's what we know about. But the index case, it's sometimes it's hard to tell. You can, you can ask. What they used to, what they did, what they typically did. Often, by the time you're investigating an outbreak, uh, the patient has already died, and so they can't tell their story themselves. 
Um, the most recent case reported and confirmed and just today from India in the same area, um, according to the media reports, I'm sure it'll be on ProMed for those of you who want to look it up, um, it, he was a student and so had been in many different places recently. And so, um, you know, that can also happen. It becomes more difficult to piece together their clinical history and their exposure history when they've, when they've been in multiple places. So going, and, and this is an important thing we have to learn, it's, it's the same bats involved in terms of, we you know, Nipovirus circulates in tropus medius. And I do want to make the point that this is not, uh, you know, anything to do with bats, you know, maliciously interacting with people. It's not transmitted through bites or, or, or bats suddenly, you know, showering Nipovirus on people. But these are incidental exposures, really, that are due to human activities, like the palm sap harvesting that, that bats have learn to exploit bay palm sap as a food resource and contamination of the sap, you know, with excretion and occasionally NEPA virus leads to exposure. It's important in southern India to understand how spillover occurs to, to interrupt that transmission. But, but going back to what we, we know in Bangladesh with bay palm sap, now that that word is out, that bay palm sap is a primary route of transmission, why are we still seeing NEPA virus outbreaks? I mean, can't you just tell people to stop drinking sap? Yeah. Well, I mean, we can look at the example of the United States and guidelines on how to prevent cardiovascular disease um, and dietary um, advice. We know very well how to prevent it, yet somehow people still um, have coronary uh, disease and die from it uh, in record numbers. So somehow humans don't always do what they're told. And I think the same is true for, for Nipah and date palm sap. And I think particularly for a disease that's rare, um, if, you, if you've been drinking date palm sap your whole life, uh, as has everyone else uh, in your village, uh, no one's ever been sick from it before. But occasionally, you know, someone comes to tell you, you know, there have been a few people who died after drinking this. Well, okay. Um, is, that a, is that a risk for any individual? Um, not really. It's it's not a it, it's a strong motivator for me not to drink date palm sap. Um, but uh, for someone who you know within their culture is so normalized and part of their daily life, uh, it's a much less urgent uh, problem. And, and just before we wrap up this part of the discussion, Larry, let me bring this over to you with a contagion scenario. Now, right? I mean, Emily's raising a good point. It is incredibly hard to. Um, change people's behavior, particularly when there isn't a perception of risk necessarily, and it's yeah. it's a deeply ingrained cultural practice. But we saw with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa that there were some healthcare providers, and in fact, um, a, a non-healthcare provider that came back to the United States infected with Ebola, okay, which which you know threw us for a loop in a lot of ways. We have Nipah virus spilling over in one of the most populous places on Earth, in near cities that have international airports connecting Hong Kong, London, Delhi, New York, Boston. From the Massachusetts public health standpoint, from a US public health standpoint, what would it look like if a person came into the United States infected with the virus? Well, I have to say there are a lot of things on our radar right now, and that probably isn't Paramount. NEPA is probably not high on the list. I mean, we worry about Ebola, we worry about measles, we worry about MERS, um, but very few people are aware of, of NEPA and its potential for ongoing transmission. So I do think it's something um, perhaps this symposium will raise our awareness of and make us, make us more aware going forward. Um, I think most clinicians um, in the US, most quarantine officials would not recognize a case of, of NEPA infection. So this will catch us by surprise if it happens. It, it, it could, could well. Yeah. As, could, as could, you know, as, as you alluded to disease X, you know, the, uh, it's, it's also always a possibility. You know, I think it requires us to be vigilant and um, it requires us to have good um, public health capacity and good laboratory capacity. But also I think like a, like a really strong focus would be uh, infection control in hospitals. As we've seen with the MERS coronavirus outbreak, mm -hmm. these first world hospitals in Saudi Arabia are still very vulnerable for notosocomial transmission. So transmission 
from hospital patient to hospital patient. Mm -hmm. And I don't think US or Europe would be any different in that scenario, what we've already seen with the Texas patient with Ebola, who mm -hmm. transmitted this Ebola to, to nurses. And in this case, Nipah virus, when we already know it has human to human transmission capacity, also focusing those codes on hospital settings, I think that should be higher on the radar, like introducing infectious diseases even when us not knowing what it is, but really that these hospital settings can really be an amplifier. And I, I think it's important also to consider you know, the information we have about hospital transmission of NIPA really comes from outbreaks in India and Bangladesh, you know, largely from Bangladesh. Um, the context of hospital care in Bangladesh is completely different than it would be here in the United States. Um, and if you are, from the perspective of the virus, um, if you are in a patient in a hospital in Bangladesh, you have few opportunities. That patient isn't going to receive any kind of invasive uh, procedures for intervention. Um, you are only going to come into contact probably with the family caregivers who are in that hospital taking care of you. Um, you, you have few opportunities. I mean, if you contrast that with um, an ICU, which is where a patient would end up in the United States, um, there are going to be multiple invasive procedures that would expose healthcare workers and other people to potentially infectious body fluids. Um, you would be uh, on a ventilator, uh, which then you know, would be contaminated. There are so many more opportunities um, for transmission, and I think that even in places, you know, India's uh, healthcare system, at least where these patients, many of these patients are being cared for, um, offers a, an improved level of care. Um, Bangladesh is coming along. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Their infrastructure is going to change. And 10 years from now, it's going to look completely different there. And you have more and more people, more and more NIFA patients that are confirmed seeking care and high needs. Um, more modern facilities that do offer these kinds of care. That's a very different ecological environment for the virus and new opportunities. Hmm. So all more reason to stay and vigilant. control is important. Yeah. And th these are actually yeah. the things we can actually take to the lab. And we've done that with mm -hmm. Ebola, uh, showing how long it stays infectious, how you can disinfect it, disinfect it. We've done that for MERS coronavirus, showing that it actually really likes climate controlled areas. So Basically, the virus we're sitting right now, 20 degrees Celsius, 40% relative humidity. The virus is like that, and they actually stay viable for, let's say, one or two hours on time, which basically can move them by the ventilation system in the hospital from one room to the next. And we're kind of we're trying to look into that for the virus as well. So, what is the capacity for the Nipah virus to actually stay viable in the aerosol? Uh, what is the uh, rate at which it actually gets like less viable over time and it deposited on certain surfaces how can you best contaminate it and very sometimes you have to do research that's relatively like i think like very observable level so to speak it doesn't always have to be very complicated so this is great and i think we covered a lot of ground i want to give our students an opportunity and those in the audience an opportunity to ask questions of the panel to get a little discussion going there as well. So thanks for staying with us. Um, you guys in the room, questions for our illustrious panel, or Brian, if we have questions from folks tuning in. I'm wondering if the technology is advanced enough or are there enough scientific findings to develop a quality control test to detect any viruses in the sap, in the sap itself. Yeah. Um, so we, you can take environmental swabs, you could swab sap um, and look for virus in the sap. Sure. Um, we haven't done it, uh, mostly because it's uh, like looking for a needle in a haystack. So in any given day, there are a million trees that are collecting sap with people drinking the sap. Um, so it, you could test many, many pots of sap, not find anything, but um, 
that finding wouldn't necessarily be meaningful because we know it's being transmitted that way. Um, that said, we might think about uh, ways, and we've been discussing ways of perhaps um, swabbing the shaved surface of date palm trees as a way to detect when and where bats may be shedding virus, um, even if it doesn't make it all the way into the pot, like looking at the place where bats come and, uh, and lick the sound. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the technology's there. But just uh, the effort, if, if you know, we could get a whole army of people to go out and collect by sap and, and uh, you know, thousands of, of field based PCR machines. But, but, I think, but I think there, like, it really, it's a, it's a very good question. It also ties down the enormous evolution of molecular based tools over mm -hmm. the last two decades that we're now actually able to take these instruments in the field, whether that would be Bangladesh or Congo, do sequencing in the field. I think it's been an enormous revolution with a caveat too, that we're now gonna see more stuff as well, because we actually have essays to detect it. So it sounds like the date palm sap is one of the primary groups of transmission. So the obvious thing would be to put some sort of um, protective cover over the uh, shaved date palm or the collection bucket to avoid bats from accessing or contaminating the date palm sap. Have you tried this? Um, is there evidence that doing this reduces transmission to people? So um, early on we had the same thought and so we went to people who collect date palm sap as uh, as their as their occupation. Right? There are people who do this for a living. It's an agricultural product, and some of them told us about different nets and barriers they've used in trees to keep bats out because bats drink the sap. They can urinate or defecate in the sap, which makes it um, difficult to sell. Right. So so they've thought about that. Um, and we took some of their, uh, some of the approaches that they were already using and developed an intervention uh, to train, um, they're called gachis, the people who collect this app, to train them, the gachis to use it, and then also create a demand from people who drink sap um, and tell them about the benefits of drinking sap from a protected source. Because it is added effort. So it, imagine you're climbing a tree to try to hang the pot to shave the bark and to collect the sap every day. So having to carry up an extra net with you and taking the extra time to put it on and make sure it's fitted um, is an added step and it takes extra time and effort. So we wanted to create also this uh, demand for this kind of protected sap. Um, we ran a trial where we compared that uh, sort of public health message to a message of just don't drink sap uh, to a control group. And I, um, the data were a bit messy, but um, our, our best guess is that that kind of harm reduction approach where you say it's best not to drink sap, but if you do drink it from a protected source, that probably reduces um, risk of NEPA better than, than just telling people not to drink it um, and better than doing nothing at all. The difficulty, of course, is that um, policymakers are often less comfortable with harm reduction approaches for public health than they are to abstinence approaches. Um, the same is true with date palm sap and NEPA. So um, it's easier and, it, and it's more foolproof to say just never drink sap than to promote this. You shouldn't drink sap, but if you do, use this uh, covering. So it hasn't taken off. Um, and importantly, we've never been able to test it to see if it prevents transmission, because transmission is a pretty rare event, so you need a really large-scale trial to do that. I want to take a question from our, our virtual audience here. Um, this is a question from Priyanka. Would you like to, we can switch on the microphone and ask it direct? Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, where are you calling in from? Uh, I'm Priyanka. I'm a journalist from India, from Bangalore, India. Hi, Priyanka. Yeah, nice Hi. to see you. Uh, my question was, um, 
uh, uh, what is what is the significance to you of the fact that the outbreak in South India has occurred again? Uh, what does it mean for the pathway of transmission? Because the first time it happened, uh, some of the researchers were speculating that it might have to do, uh, you know, the index case might, might have been exposed uh, by eating a, a contaminated fruit or... Uh, by nursing an injured bat, that was some of the speculation going on. But uh, given the fact that the outbreak has occurred again, uh, do you suspect that there is some kind of exposure pathway like there was in Bangladesh, some kind of cultural uh, behavior? Or uh, what do you think about that? Um, I, so clearly there's an exposure pathway. Um, and I think that trying to nail that down as quickly as you can is really important. So as I'm sure you know very well, um, last year's Neva outbreak coincided with the mango season in Kerala. Um, and those farmers lost uh, their whole crop because there was this idea that it could have been spread through fruit. Um, now, it can, it can be spread, you know, theoretically, yes, a bat could drop fruit and someone could eat it. We've looked for this consistently in Bangladesh and we have never found an association between eating dropped fruit off the ground and Nipah infection. So there are many theoretical pathways, but our experience has showed that it's really just one that's driving transmission. Um, so, um, I, I think it's up to the teams in India to really try to, to figure this out. I think the fact that you've seen another case, though, this year, probably has more to do with the number of people being tested um, than anything else. It shows that, uh, that healthcare facilities and that governments there are working hard and testing people who, who have compatible signs and symptoms, which is a really good sign. Yeah. Um, honestly, I, I, it's very encouraging that it's being detected, it's being reported so quickly. So kudos to India. Yeah, and, and just to add, you know, when we start to speculate about these pathways of transmission, I mean, there are some things that are biologically plausible, and certainly fruit is a possibility. And in fact, when we look at the Malaysia outbreak, it was by a fruit that pigs were probably infected. The trouble is we don't yet understand what an infectious dose of Nipah virus really is. And so is there enough on a, a single piece of fruit to infect somebody? How would that you know, happen? We've seen other instances, even in Bangladesh, where livestock that we believe have been fed dropped fruit, at least may have antibodies against Nipah or Nipah-like viruses. But until we really are able to ask patients what exposures they've had and look in a systematic way. It really is just speculation. And I think as Emily rightly mentioned, it can cause damage potentially to speculate too much about how these things happen without evidence because you know people won't grab on to these ideas and it can impact things economically, people's livelihoods. So we do have to be careful about um, making you know statements or assessments until there's evidence. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, another question from Anna Willoughby. Hi, Anna. Am I reading this one? Ah, okay. Um, are there other hot spots of fruit farming expansion that may lead to similar bat contact across the globe, or is this an issue limited to Bangladesh? Fruit farming expansion. So perhaps talking about the phenomena that occurred in Malaysia where um, fruit orchards were growing in lockstep with pig production and livestock production because it was common to have orchards on farms um, as a supplemental form of income. And, you know, Emily, you can talk about fruit production in Bangladesh. Uh, it, it's different in that it's probably not always organized orchards per se, right? Right. I mean, most people uh, get fruit from a family garden. Yeah. It's much more common. So, so we haven't seen measurable differences in fruit production in Bangladesh um, in that respect. We, we know that, um, yeah, that it's, it's locally sourced, that we know people and, and, even, and bats, you know, like to eat some of the same things, but there, there hasn't been a growth in, in fruit production. Now, I think it'd be interesting to look at things like that in parts of India, particularly in southern India, where date palm sap 
um, isn't a, a practice, a common practice. Uh, so there must be other routes of transmission that are there. So we can start to assess um, environmental factors, changes in, in environment that may potentially influence how people and bats interact. But at this point, data around that hasn't really been um, gathered. But you can also put it in a little bit broader scope that often agricultural, changes in agricultural practices are amplifier of disease outbreaks. Oh, we've now definitely. seen again with MERS coronavirus and change in camel husbandry, or um, of course like a swine influenza virus. So, so, I so I think, I think yes. just yes. put it in a little bit broader contract outside of just like, fruit farm. Sure, absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. And it, again, it's, I think it's important mm -hmm to expect that we are going to find new transmission pathways yeah. across the landscape when new when new um, new geographic areas are implicated in outbreaks. Sure, another question in the room. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask a quick question in comparing um, like the Nipah outbreaks as well as the you know, outbreaks um, of Ebola. So like now that there's like another outbreak of, uh, of Ebola, like we see like people like attacking health workers, you know, like even like killing them. Um, and I just wanted to ask like, what do you think were some of the, the differences or like culturally or the way that people approach um, risk communication that um, led these uh, like, you know, attacks or like mistrust of like scientists not to happen in like the Nipah outbreak versus the Ebola outbreak? So I think the I think really the major difference is actually the phenotype of the virus. Where on one hand, and and uh, obviously Ebola viruses have a strong association with bats as well. Um, recently, novel Ebola virus has been uh, identified in bats. So really trying to tie that back. Those viruses, these filoviruses, Ebola virus, straight of the bat, so to speak, are capable of very efficient human to human transmission. I think that's where the biggest the biggest difference is. Whereas with uh, Nipah virus, you might have seen one or two chains of transmission, but then it typically stops um, on one hand due to intervention measures, but it's probably not going to spread anyway. Um, but Ebola has actually an intrinsic capacity for human to human transmission, and I think that is uh, by far the difference between those two viruses. I I think that it comes from um, you know, a lot of it comes from uh, an existing mistrust between communities and healthcare systems, between uh, communities and governments. Um, and I, I, I think that there are differences with Ebola and Nipah. Um, I think, but I would frame it in terms of longevity. So when something keeps going and isn't controlled, that does not that does nothing to build trust with communities. Um, so from NEPA, we've benefited a bit because the the outbreaks haven't gone on that long. So that mistrust and that crisis period is shorter in duration. Um, but we've had we've faced very similar sentiment um, during one of the largest outbreaks. Uh, we went back and tried to describe what happened socially and culturally within the outbreak. And we saw very clearly that communities did not believe our prevention messages. They thought that physicians were killing patients in, as part of the outbreak. We saw at the end of the outbreak that people stopped bringing their patients into healthcare facilities, similar to what happens in many of all outbreaks. Um, and that was because they thought specifically people were being killed uh, to, as, a, as, a, as a way to stop the outbreak. They knew that medical teams were there to stop the outbreak, but that's how they thought it was happening. And for good reason. No one who went to the hospital survived. Now that, we know that, that, has some, that that's just what happens in Nipah virus, but if you've never seen that disease before, then it's easy to see how you could create that narrative. Um, I... It's very hard to have um, respectful, constructive conversations across cultures. And I think uh, public health representatives 
um, and communities living in an outbreak area is always a cross-cultural conversation. Uh, even if you speak the same language, even if you are from the same country, simply because people coming in to investigate that outbreak have different knowledge and different words and different ways of meaning than people from that community usually will have. And so that's always a difficult thing to get right. Um, and, and frankly, I think social scientists are vastly underutilized for this because that's their core capacity. Um, uh, all too often, I think public health, very well-meaning public health uh, and, and outbreak response teams take a paternalistic approach um, that, that may not go well. And on top of it now, we also have the situation that we're not set up to actually intervene in areas of social unrest. Of course, here in the East Africa, the DRC region is like an area with active social unrest with a lot of different stakeholders who might have completely different uh, uh, power struggles going on and might even be able to prevent, actively prevent uh, interventions. So I think that's something basically more direct than to the WHO, because we have a fair number of uh, areas in the world with social unrest, like going from the Middle East and Syria. These are all like, like hot spots of uncontrolled uh, emerging infectious disease outbreaks. Okay, um, do we have a question from this Kaylin? Okay, so the question is about the Chinese government's response to emerging disease in the context of, you know, sort of generally speaking. Um, so, in, in Kaylin, are you calling, are you listening from China or is this particular, because we don't have audio? Um, I would say that, generally speaking, I mean, not wanting to comment on the government's response writ large, but, but I'd say since SARS, and Larry, you have some new perspective on this too, um, there certainly was um, I think a very concerted effort for China to uh, address emerging diseases within the country, you know, following SARS. And, and an example we see now is with um, concerns of African swine fever, um, we saw outbreaks of other diseases. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 and I think, uh, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, and, um, we were discussing earlier um, during during the SARS outbreak, there was an effort, uh, and not by any means unique to China, of, of, of governments to control um, bad news, essentially, that, that governments are always reluctant to discuss bad news, and um, mysterious or emerging infectious diseases are certainly among pieces of bad news that, um, that, that governments sometimes try not to um, broadcast. Um, I think, uh, however, um, you know, using the example of SARS, the Chinese government responded um, really impressively to containing the SARS outbreak, um, a disease for which there was no vaccine, and yet was brought under control using uh, really uh, you know, just, um, traditional public health isolation and quarantine methods um, responded admirably. And I think um, since uh, the SARS outbreak, there has been really um, admirable transparency uh, from China about um, outbreaks, including, um, including avian influenza, the H7N9, for example, um, outbreaks have been really uh, transparent and reporting in real time on those outbreaks. So I think, um, you know, this is not something unique to China in any way. There's, a, there's often a reluctance on the part of, of official public health to talk about bad news until, um, until they really need to. And um, I think it's a, an effort that we, we um, always try to encourage the transparency as much as possible. Yeah, just to throw in an anecdote, not to get too much off topic, but we've talked about Ebola a little bit, and, and I think um, particularly in areas like West Africa that has been traumatized by the Ebola outbreak and how many people were infected, there's a reluctance to, um, to or, or a sensitivity to it when it comes to reporting cases. But, but having worked now in Liberia and West Africa and worked with partners that are working in Sierra Leone and Guinea, we've seen um, a nice, 
a good willingness by governments to transparently talk about surveillance efforts and results from those. And I'll give you an example. Recently, through a USAID PREDICT project, we've been looking at uh, potential fat reservoirs for Ebola. And in November of 2018, we found Zaire Ebola virus, uh, RNA detection, so viral genetic material in a bat in Liberia. And we spoke to our government partners as soon as we were certain of the finding to say, hey, you know, the surveillance is working. Look, we found something. And there were initial concerns about, okay, so what does that mean? We have Zaire Ebola virus here. Uh, there are no human cases, right? No human cases. This is just in a bat, but it's our first important clue to understanding which bat species might be carrying this. And it's something that, um, you know, up to them, but it's something that would be good to talk about because it's really evidence of proactive measures that you're taking as a government to understand a bit more about where Ebola is when it's not causing an outbreak in people. And to their credit, and the reason I'm bringing this up is that it was, a, I, I thought it was terrific. In January, the government um, issued a press release. It was during a regular weekly press conference that the Ministry of Health gave. and they announced the finding as just that, as a, a, a result of surveillance that's ongoing to better understand Zaire Ebola virus and protect the population from it. So now that we understand which bats could potentially carry it, we can give more concrete advice about how to avoid getting exposed to it. So I agree with you, Larry, that I think we're seeing more transparency, more willingness to publicly talk about some of these disease events that may have at one, you know, one time been more sensitive. You know, I think, and part of that I think is attributable just to um, you know, the, as we talked about the volume of data that are out there, the, the flow of information is it's harder to restrict. Okay, um, let's take one more question from Elena. We have audio. Hello, Elena. Hi there. <laughs> um, so my question is about um, we've spoken about vaccines, but what are some of the prospects in terms of improving rapid diagnostic capacity to actually identify patients and then? Um, some of the antivirals that have been kind of whirling around. Um, and then kind of a sidebar to that is where's the balance between some of the more high tech interventions, thinking antivirals, and then kind of your basic hand hygiene infection control to prevent human transmission. Wants to feel this one. Well, I can, I can, start, I can, I can start with the diagnostics. I think, um, if you look at the West African Ebola, so, so we're now starting to broadly put things more in perspective of emerging infectious diseases uh, along certain of those hotspots, whether that would be Bangladesh um, or in this case, Central Africa. Um, we do see a push for availability of more rapid molecular diagnostic tests. Um, so there's been networks of TB surveillance, so tuberculosis, the same kind of networks you can use, for instance, for Ebola surveillance. The biggest problem is, of course, still that the initial syndromic surveillance needs to be on site. So you still need that nurse or that doctor actually seeing this kind of patient and reporting this is something which I'm not familiar with. And to reporting that back to uh, local healthcare settings or provincial healthcare settings and then funneling that back to the, for instance, in this case, DRC Kinshasa or Republic of Congo Brazzaville. I think there should be more efforts in training in observation-based, syndromic-based surveillance um, and not just like, that needs to go on top of like building more diagnostic. But if you really wanna prevent these kind of outbreaks, I don't think you can ever really prevent the zoonotic transmission because at least for now, we don't really understand that. In Bangladesh, we understand that better than, for instance, for Ebola, but you're still not able to block that, right? You know what to do, but people are not doing it. Oh, yeah, or maybe with a vaccine, we could. Yes, but then, really but then, of course, then you get into then you get into like more the medical question: Is that uh, amount of money well invested in a vaccine for Nipah? or would you invest that in basic healthcare setting? But it's of course not a discussion we currently have. Um, but I think on the, on the diagnostic part, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of infrastructure building, both in Bangladesh as well as in Africa, um, really with the key that um, as opposed to like new outbreaks, 
where teams are coming in to diagnose that, people should be able to do that on site, uh, either with, preferably without support of any Western entities, uh, but if needed, of course, they can always step in. Yeah, and I want to, you know, getting ready to ask you, panel, a final question before we get to that. Also, and maybe you could talk about the importance of building capacity within country. You know, where I realize that we on this panel are sitting here as Western scientists who have been directly involved in the effort to, you know, study and protect populations against Nipah virus, but there is an entire range of people in these countries that we work with that are working on the ground as well. And can we talk about the importance of capacity building, the importance of building diagnostic capacity, field capacity, ability to recognize and deal with these outbreaks on the ground where they're happening? And um, Emily, yeah, let's start with you. Um, the outbreaks, any, any kind of outbreak, but I think uh, NEPA outbreaks in particular are events that capture people's attention and concern. Um, and within that context um, is a great place to start <laughs> building capacity uh, because there, there's a, you know, every, people are clearly interested in it after there's been an outbreak. Um, and you can build on that interest, I think, in a way to make really meaningful differences and ability to respond to any kind of outbreak, um, uh, lab capacity, that you, where at least you can rule things out and know if there's a new disease X that's coming. So I think um, in Bangladesh, NEPA catalyzed a group of collaborators. It catalyzed government and research collaborations uh, to respond to those communities in crisis, then really take that example, build on it to increase capacity uh, for all kinds of uh, disease surveillance and outbreaks. Um, and in particular, argue successfully for a One Health approach, which really was led by uh, government of Bangladesh, um, uh, from within different ministries who saw and used NEPA as an example to build that coalition. Um, and at the risk of sounding melodramatic, um, there are teams in country as a part of the healthcare system, as a part of the local research uh, organizations that risk their lives every year responding to outbreaks, you know, in the absence of vaccines or therapeutics. It, it's a, uh, it's um, not a completely safe activity all the time, but they're on the ground doing it every day and, and, and they're deeply involved and dedicated to that kind of capacity building within the country. And I want to add to that point, it's an absolutely important one. Not only is it uh, capacity building within health ministries, but we're seeing veterinary involvement and in, in what's pretty rare globally, wildlife involvement. And NEPA is a, a case where, because we understand that it comes from bats, the Bangladesh government early on incorporated surveillance in bats as part of outbreak response and surveillance, which is terrific. And it really helped to complete that One Health approach. So it wasn't just looking at livestock and humans, but really looking at the whole picture and understanding where this virus is coming from on a regular basis. It changed the perspective for the wildlife department in terms of the role they might play in health, which was new, and it even changed the way that the veterinary department um, engaged and got involved. And, and so that's been a really important change, I think, in the local capacity and approach. Yeah, absolutely. They're a fantastic case study. Yeah. Uh, they, they did some really amazing things. Well, a different flavor of capacity building, really, and what I have struggled with for a very long time now is to find the folks that are in these areas in which we know we have NEPA outbreaks, to have the resources to take ownership of things like antivirals, mm -hmm. right? So forget the vaccine. And the antiviral, the antibody, that made sense because Australia really wanted it for post-exposure for Hendra. And really only until last year in Kerala was now there's, there's interest on the ground for them to take ownership of our antibodies. So we've given, we're giving them the same cell line that produces the same antibody. And at least now with this one individual yesterday diagnosed again in Kerala with NEPA, 
So there are more than 80 people actually now with Traceback Watch. Yeah. And there are four additional close contacts that have developed fever. But in this particular case, because of that interest last year, they actually have 50 doses of the monoclonal there in Kerala. So that's the last I heard just about an hour ago. And I don't know if any of those people with fever onset now have been given any of the therapeutic. We just don't know if it's gonna be effective in a clinically ill person. But in this case, you know, it took 10 days for the diagnosis of the first case. And he does have neurologic signs, okay? Whereas the other individuals may not. So that's the question. And, and it could very well happen today or tomorrow as to whether or not that this really only affected, you know, robustly affected antiviral could have some activity and we may know. And when you talk about ownership, what you mean is not just use of, but production of as well? Both, locally. both, yeah. So someone there in the country that is interested needs to take ownership of seeing, of seeing this through, it's just to seeing the use of these things, whether they be a diagnostic or, or a therapeutic. Right? And it's taken a long time for this interest to actually come, come to a head now. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it requires training. You know, it's a, it's a pretty intense thing to do, right? I mean, they, they need a place to store it. They need that with good electricity and they need True. Uh, training, a trained physician who, know, who can monitor patients very closely. And so it's the interest in having the capacity to do that that's really new and unique there. I think we need to build that into our responses clearly is that we, you know, as part of our responses to, to outbreaks needs to be local capacity building. Um, and you know, it applies to event-based surveillance or, or to virology or to medical um, care, you know, you know and para parachute and yes, response. Yes, and yes, clinical trial infrastructure, because all those treatments will still be, uh, these experimental treatments will still go under a clinical trial uh, protocol. So you need to build already into these countries clinical trial infrastructure, or at least as uh, just pointed out, like uh, there's a year ongoing meetings and stuff to get that protocol in place, and you are still seem to be losing time. Yeah. And I think that is, critical that we need to have that in place in risk areas. And we see that now too, whereas we're now happy that we can actually put the VSV vaccine into use in East Africa, but it took actually a lot of negotiation in the 2017 and 18 outbreak with the Ministry of Health in DRC to actually be able to have that stamped up by the Ministry of Health so that they can now actually already in the outbreak later start using that. But there are still like, for instance, high risk countries like Gabon and Republic of Congo who do not have any clinical trial infrastructure for this particular vaccine, while well, there is maybe a little bit lower at risk for Ebola virus, DRC, but at very high risk. So I think that's, that's a new kind of realization that yes, we need surveillance, we need molecular diagnostics, but we need clinical trial infrastructure so, and you're hitting upon how I want to wrap this up because I think it's it's been an incredible conversation because we span from understanding Nipah virus as a model to in wildlife reservoirs, spillover into people, human epidemiology, physiology and pathophysiology and lab animal models to developing therapeutics and detecting new outbreaks. Just when we're starting to get a handle on how Nipah virus is operating in one location like Bangladesh, we're seeing an outbreak in a new place with potentially a new way of getting from bats into people. So let me ask you this panel. With what we know now, what are the, the next most important steps we need to take to stop Nipah virus from becoming a global pandemic? And from there, what are we gonna do to stop disease X? What have we learned from Nipah and the experience with Nipah to help us better deal with disease X? I'm gonna start with you, Larry. So, so I, you know, I, I will I will address this through the lens of early detection because I think um, with whatever you're looking at, the sooner the faster you can recognize it and, and, and begin a response, the better the response is going to be. The easier it is to, to limit or mitigate an outbreak. And so I think it starts with vigilance. And just you have to stay attuned. And some you used the example earlier of what if if a, if a Nipah virus came into um, to the um, national airport 
or, or Logan Airport in Boston, and how, how would somebody recognize that and, and find that? And that's partly education, partly uh, you know, a good all hazards approach to emerging diseases. And then um, once an outbreak begins, how do you recognize it and, uh, and, and see something that's anomalous and have an ability to report that quickly and transparently? Um, those are the those are the, the most important features to me, Chris. I think that what I like to say is I think the the, least, the most recent episodes of NEPA allow one to say it's and, and stemming from the Ebola outbreak from just a few years ago is there has to be interest in putting the horse in front of the cart. We always seem to be reactive and we're never quite ready as we think. But as Vincent just pointed out, this goal of putting a clinical trial protocol in place with people that are going to be networked into this ahead of time for the next outbreak of NEPA in India, it actually might show efficacy. It might, show, it might functionally show that this model could work. But there has to be interest from, a, from a, a variety of partners to do this, but we're almost there, I think. Yeah, and I think on that same level, I think, uh, again, situation in West Africa that we now have vaccines. I think uh, Emily already talked about the people on the front line. We have people who would actually be the healthcare workers who would actually be a very good start on like the phase one and phase two clinical trial. So there is no need and unfortunately we have like developments and hopefully the first vaccines, uh, Chris's vaccine is going to be tested in phase one clinical trial. There are a number of other candidates who are hopefully gonna, gonna reach that level as well. Uh, but I think that's really a promising development that we can start utilizing vaccines and basically the same as you would potentially do an Ebola virus outbreak, you vaccinate your healthcare and at risk population and potentially use it in a ring vaccination kind of scenario. There's no one approach, right, that's going to solve everything. Um, but if I can put on my epidemiologist hat, and advocate for investment in diagnostics and surveillance infrastructure. Um, I, it is, I think, the less sexy of all of these initiatives. <laughs> um, testing lots of people who don't have disease uh, can feel futile at times, but I think that ultimately, um, you know, we're, we're not gonna see cases if we're not looking. My guess is we miss a lot of cases because we're not looking. If we invest in surveillance infrastructure and we find more cases uh, and we investigate them rigorously, it gives us the understanding of the transmission pathways. It gives us the platforms around which to build clinical trials capacity and test therapeutics and vaccines. Um, you know, if, if we don't have surveillance you know, if you only have it in a couple of places, you don't even have numbers to test some of these uh, new products in a rigorous way. Um, and I think ultimately, if we want to make, if, if we have a promising you know, therapeutic or vaccine, there's got to be a business case. And how do we know how many, how many NEPA cases, how many human uh, NEPA virus infections are there? That's ultimately the calculation, and, and we don't know, and I, I'd like to see us invest more in that. So it's perfect. There is no one approach. Mm -hmm. And the very reason you're all here is because we wanted to show how important each of these different approaches is to pulling together the pieces of the puzzle. And although we all live in a world with limited resources, it takes experience and pulling these pieces together to really start to think about how to have an efficient and effective approach. And that's the position we're in today. We're learning as we go, but I think every piece of the puzzle we put together really helps us you know, build an effective way forward to protect ourselves against what we know about and the things we don't yet know about as well. So I wanna thank you all so much for coming today. Thank you to our panel. Thank those of you who are joining us virtually. Thank you to the students who are here today. Um, if you're interested in, in, if you missed some of this and want to see more of it, follow EcoHealth Alliance on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're going to be archiving today's discussion. You'll be able to access it in the future. It'll be posted there soon. So thank you all for your time. 
students help me thank our panel today. And signing off from EcoHealth Net 2019. We'll see you next time.